pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from John chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done he cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, 
Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Here ends the lesson. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're in the second, uh, third Sunday of Lent, and we're almost halfway done with this experience of uh, this annual experience we have of preparing ourselves for Easter. The Lenten season can often dredge up for you uh, all of the awful things that you remember about yourself. And I am with you on that. Uh, I am often amazed that I am an Episcopal priest. My wife is often amazed that I am uh, alive as a human being just because of the 17-year period between about the age of 13 to 30, where I was, I don't know if the word is reckless, but it's a pretty good word. And my behavior did not match myself, and I was pretty much behaving um, like an idiot, I guess is the best way to put it. And so in that stretch of time, I have a lot of memories and I wince a lot. I wince about things I said. I kind of am shocked by the way that I acted towards other people, the way that I thought about myself, the frustration that I had with myself. And around 24, I had a moment where I asked for the prayers of a, of a priest. I know exactly where I was when I asked for those prayers. I was in Austin, Texas, at a place called St. Stephen's School at a retreat for, a college, or for high school kids. I was a youth minister. And I asked this priest for prayers because I was full of rage and anger, and I wanted healing from that. I had an idea that my rage and my anger came from my rage and anger at a parent, my father, who had left our family when I was four. And not to go into too great a detail, but he died before, I never saw him again. He left when I was four and he died when I was 19 and I never saw him again. And it was only through stories from my mom and only through stories from my aunt and a cousin or two that I could piece together the mystery of this man who was my father. And I was mad because, I, the one, I didn't have a dad. But two, I was mad because I didn't have, part of me was missing and I, I couldn't express because he left when I was four and I was, man, I didn't have any, I, I can't be mad. How do I be mad at the giant who's in charge? I, I couldn't, under, I couldn't. And I had to live this life where I would make up stories. Like, where's your dad? Uh, my dad, uh, my dad's over there. I don't know. Why don't you have a dad? Well, I don't know. I just don't, don't, don't know. And all of that kind of built up 
over many years and was just sort of making my life miserable, right about 24, and so I asked for these prayers. And that began a journey of healing for me that was phenomenal. All the way up until just a few weeks ago, when I was visiting with a friend and she was talking to me about my life and I was talking about my dad and she said, you know, it just is interesting about your dad because my father dies at 49 years old of a heart attack. And she said, you know, he physically died of a heart attack, but do you think maybe he died of a broken heart? And I, I began to kind of go back through my father's history and I would think about, yeah, you know what, maybe he did. Maybe that's true. Not just the divorce from my mother and the complete, complete exile away from his two children, my sister and me, but his broken heart goes all the way back to a tragedy that happened to him when he was three months old and my grandmother, Vivian, uh, killed herself right before Christmas in 1938. And the weight of that action by her and her own brokenness and the way that that was transferred onto my father and to his own brokenness, which was transferred some more onto me and my sister and my mom and that brokenness, all of that brokenness seemed to be a burden that I had suddenly inherited, I guess. But I would realize that my father's brokenheartedness was something that was just so sad. To bind up the brokenhearted is one of the things we say about our Christian faith. I tell you this story on this uh, Sunday in, in Lent uh, after the story about the Samaritan woman at the well and her own sort of weird brokenness of multiple husbands, her brokenness as being from the Samaritan group, which is not the group, her brokenness of being away from uh, God in one sense, but close to God in another, the brokenness of a system, the brokenness of relationships, all of that brokenness, here comes Jesus, and she give me something to drink which he shouldn't be doing in the culture he's in. But she does, and they have a conversation at a well. And because of that conversation, many Samaritans came to understand and to believe that Jesus is our Savior. And it's in that little, little bit here, right here in the middle of Lent, where we're going to get into some really heartbreaking stuff when we walk through Holy Week. And we watch Jesus' heartbreak, and we watch the disciples' heartbreak. We watch all of this breaking occur. And we can look in our lives and see our own brokenness. We can see our own anger. We can see our own frustrations. We can see our own behavior. And suddenly we can see all of that being piled onto this crucifixion which will occur. And something for us to kind of ponder as we make our way that way to Easter is that right here in the middle of Lent, with all of our broken stuff, we should start letting it go. It's the past. I am not the person I was between 13 and 30, by a long shot. I am not the person I was when I was behaving that way. Through prayer and, and a request for healing, through hard work of thinking and writing and journaling and talking and giving myself to the process of healing, I've found that Jesus does something very good to the brokenhearted. Jesus mends the brokenhearted. And that's you, and that's me, and that's us. We're that woman at the well. We've got a past, but we also have our future. 
And we will go through brokenheartedness again and again. We will know it. Grief is guaranteed as a human. But we, we Christian people, we have something to share. Good news. Beautiful news. Glorious news. That Jesus Christ is our Savior. And we want to share that news with the world. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for making us in your image to share in the ordering of your world. Receive the work of our hands in this place, which we set apart for your worship, the building up of the living and the remembrance of the dead, to the praise and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Glory to Him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.